The Lord bless you. You may be seated. I fully understand the work situation, uh, but since we're a smaller group, it really would help if everybody was sitting down in this lower section. It's all right if you don't want to move, but it would help. Praise God. Um, what a wonderful move of the Lord we had last night. Praise God. I didn't even realize I was hoarse. Uh, let's see, that's better. Okay. I know it looks like there's a lot of pages here to cover, but a lot of the material that's left in the notes, I'm simply going to uh, uh, basically read for your information. There's only some parts of it I'm really going to teach in depth, primarily because uh, a lot of it is, is really just informational. That's why we don't have as much to do as it looks like we do. Because <laughs> it looks like we got a long way to go. And I intend to finish the notes today. Fair warning. Okay? So that means if you have to leave, uh, it's certainly understandable. Praise God. But this is an opportunity that I cannot pass up because uh, this material needs to be taught so that the uh, DVDs can be av made available not just here but in a lot of different places because as you've already perceived, shame is a major issue. And if you thought it was after last night, the saying is, you ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, as we go through this, this, these scriptures and these principles, you'll find that uh, by the time we're through, uh, you'll find that shame is the number one problem. In fact, it, at home, I've preached and taught shame so much. There are people there that think that I think the only problem a person ever has is shame. If they have a problem, it's shame. Well, you know what? It's not very far from the truth. Not very far. So, we're going to start with Roman numeral 3 on page 4, where we left off last night. And we're going to start heavy immediately. Okay? Shame is a grudge that I harbor against myself. Shame is a grudge that I harbor against myself. Myself. Now, I want to talk about unforgiveness a little bit. Unforgiveness is the most damaging of all sins because, number one, unforgiveness is the only, it, it, unforgiveness removes the blood from previously forgiven sin opening the door for me to struggle with all of my old habits, desires, etc. The International Version, Matthew 18, 34 says, In anger his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. Of course, the context that this verse is in is about the man that, had the t that owed the 10,000 talents. And the king said, pay up. He said, I can't pay up. The king said, throw him into jail. He said, master... Have mercy on me. And the, and the king said, okay, you're forgiven. He goes out, finds a fellow servant that owes him 100 pence, which is a very small amount con con compared to uh, 1,000 talents or 10,000 talents. And when the man says exactly the same thing to him, he says to the man, pay up. The guy says, I can't. When the man says exactly the same things to him that he said to the king, he refused to forgive. And the scripture says that the king said, or the master said, turn him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. Now, the point is, if he had been forgiven of everything, what did he owe? The only way he owed anything was 
his unforgiveness took back God's forgiveness of his sin. And you think about that a little bit. It's the scariest thing you can imagine. No other sin. No other sin. If I went out and committed adultery today, now the Lord would forgive me, but my wife would scratch my eyes out. But uh, if I went to the Lord and I said, forgive me, he would forgive me. Tomorrow, if I went out, if I was still alive and, and committed adultery, I wouldn't have to repent for yesterday's and today's adultery. I'd only have to repent of today's adultery. If I tell a lie today and I ask the Lord to forgive me and I I lie tomorrow, I only have to repent of tomorrow's lie. I don't have to repent of tomorrow's and today's lie. Hello? But if someone offends me, and I do not forgive them. I am not now dealing with today's sin. I'm dealing with all my sin. Because I can't ask God to do something for me that I'm not willing to do for you. And the scripture says that very specifically, and I don't have all the verses in here, but it's really an easy, easy study to find out what the scripture says about the fact that a person who, who will not forgive, he's, then the Lord won't forgive you either. I can't earn or deserve God's forgiveness, but I can disqualify myself for being forgiven. No matter how humble, no matter how much hard I pray, no matter how much I weep, if I will not forgive you, I will not be forgiven. I disqualify myself. But if that was it, all of it, that would be bad enough as it is. But when when I take the risk that the Lord is going to uncover all of the sin that He's already covered by His blood, and now I'm going to be a debtor for all of that again, Now, there are some that would debate over that, but let me tell you something. The problem, again, is this. If I don't forgive you, what I do is open myself up to my past sins. That's why it'll seem as though a person is doing really well for a long time. I, I, I have a man that I've worked with. He had been delivered of alcohol. Uh, years and years and years ago, when he alcohol and drugs, when he got saved, twenty years, he went out, went without drinking anything or using any alcohol. But he got into a situation where he felt like he was wronged. He wouldn't forgive. He got angry. He feel he felt like it was unjust. He wanted them to suffer. Guess what it was. It wasn't long till he discovered he'd started drinking. Why? Because his anger and his unforgiveness opened the door to the things he had been delivered of. Now, the problem is, this is true even if the anger is against yourself. The problem is, this is true even if the grudge you have is against you. The man in Matthew 18, 34, had already been forgiven of of this debt, but his unforgiveness made him liable for it again. The debt was his past sins, according to Matthew 7, 12. Unforgiveness is the only sin that can provoke God to remove the blood from previously forgiven sins. If you, if you suddenly walked out of here today and backslid, when you came back to God, you would not deal with the sins that you'd committed before, uh, while you were saved and before you got saved the first time. You would only deal with the sins that you committed after you backslid. You backslid. That's the problem, though. The problem is sin 
or unforgiveness. You know, I've had people say to me, well, what is the unpardonable sin? Well, I, I'm not ready to make this a doctrine, but I believe to some degree unforgiveness is the unpardonable sin. Because if I won't forgive you, I can't be pardoned. Praise God. Number two, unforgiveness prevents God from answering my prayers. Especially the prayer of repentance. Mark, Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. And when ye stand praying, forgive. If you have ought against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. That's scary stuff right there. Is it really willing, is it, am I really willing for God to shut down my prayer life and stop hearing and answering my prayers just so I can hold a grudge? Oh, but they did me really wrong. Really? How wrong could they have done you to make it worth it to you to live so that your prayers will never be answered? Well, I can see it in your eyes that this puts a whole different light on stuff, doesn't it? Sure it does. Unforgiveness, number three, turns my life over to the tormentors. Matthew eighteen thirty-five, And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you if you from your hearts forgive not every man his brother their trespasses. Many people have no joy, no peace, no contentment, no direction, no purpose, etc. in their walk with God. Why? Because they're living in torment. Why does a person have no joy, no peace, no purpose, no motivation? Life full of confusion, unforgiveness. They don't have a clue as to why their lives are like this either. In their minds, they're doing everything that they know to do and nothing is going right for them. They're living in torment. They're, they're tormented. Why are they clueless? They have excused the presence of unforgiveness in their hearts. We've justified it. I have a right to feel this way. I have been wronged. Really? You better check the price tag on that. It's really high and it's never on sale. The price of holding a grudge is the highest price you'll ever pay for anything. Nothing will ever change for these, tor these that are tormented until they forgive every one his brother their trespasses. Number four, unforgiveness gives Satan an advantage over us. <laughs> Second Corinthians 10, 11. Let such an one think this, that such... As we are in word by letters when we are absent, such will we be also indeed when present. Oh, what happened here? That's not the scriptures. I must have made a mistake there. The scripture says that if we do not forgive, we give Satan an advantage over us. I did some wrestling in high school and in college. I had to take uh, two semesters of wrestling as a part of our fitness uh, at the Naval Academy and also learning some self-defense. And uh, so uh, in, in, 
I don't know how a wrestling's done here, but it's essentially this way in Olympic wrestling, or at least one main part of it. There's three periods, and in the first period, you start out with both guys standing up, and then if one guy hasn't pinned the other one by then, uh, then you, you, you start out where uh, the, uh, the first guy is down on all fours, and the other guy is able to come around from behind put his hand on this, this, this elbow and wrap his arm around this guy, and that's called having the advantage. It means, though you're not defeated yet and you're not pinned yet, the other guy starts out in control. In the, in the first round of that match, both guys are standing up. They have e- they, they're on equal footing. But if you don't win the first one, one of you is going to start out with the advantage and the other one's going to have the disadvantage. Amen. Did they... Uh, Well, that's what it says is here, but it's not, that's not what it reads. It's 2. Yeah, this is 10. Second, in their notes, it's 2 Corinthians 2, 10 and 11, but it's 2 Corinthians, uh, excuse me, in their notes, it says 2 Corinthians 10, 11 through 12. It's actually 2 Corinthians 2, 11 through 12. That's very important. Let's read 10 and 11 here. I'm sorry. I need to remember to change that in my notes here. Let such a one think, think, I'm sorry. Let's go to nine, please. To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgive I it in the person of Christ. Verse 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, For we are not ignorant of his devices. When you don't forgive, you give Satan the advantage. You give him control. That doesn't mean you stop being a Christian. That doesn't mean you're demon possessed. But it means you give him the upper hand. Amen. Unforgiveness renders us helpless to defend ourselves against the devil. This inability to defend ourselves will continue to intensify until we are completely under his influence. If I accept that condition as the price to keep my grudge, it will progress, the situation will progress until I reach the place that he is in complete control. That's what it means to pin somebody in wrestling. You start out with one man down and the other having the advantage. Come, you guys come here and help me a minute. Let me, let me, I want them to see this. I want you to get out on all fours facing this way. All right? A brother, come around this side. Yeah, that's it. Put all four. That's it. Now get down beside him. I want you to put your left hand here. And I want you to put your other hand around here. And this is how they start. Now notice, the guy on top only has control. Now let's do this. I want you to roll over in your back. Okay? And I want you to hold, it, hold his chest down. Okay, there you go. You know what this is called? This means he's pinned, he loses. Thank you. See the difference? The difference is you start out with your opponent having control, having the advantage, but because he has the advantage, you're just trying to survive. You're not trying to win. You're trying to keep from getting pinned. You're not on the offensive. You start out completely on the defensive. When you have a grudge, that's the place you put the devil in your life. You give him control. You're not defeated yet, but you're not, you don't have the victory either. But you're, all you're doing is battling to survive. But because he has control, the only way, the only way that you will get free from that control is forgive. 
as long as you're going to battle to keep from him pinning you or totally taking control and you're trying to do that without forgiving, you're never going to get free. He will be able to hold on to you. And if he holds on long enough, he'll eventually put a move on you and you'll find yourself flat on your back, pinned, defeated. That's what unforgiveness does to you. It gives Satan the advantage. Praise God. Number five, unforgiveness wraps all of my perceptions of my, oh, excuse me, wraps. Unforgiveness warps all of my perceptions of myself, other people, and my feelings about myself and what I think other people feel about me, thus preventing me from seeing things clearly and making unreliable all of my decisions. Now, that, that may be a little hard to follow, but I'm going to explain it for you. Acts 24, 16. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and man. Now look in your notes and you'll see that on the next page, the, the Strong's de definition of the word conscience is co-perception. Webster's Dictionary says the word conscience means a knowledge, of, or, uh, knowledge or sense of right and wrong with an urge to do right. It's moral judgment that opposes the violation of a previously recognized ethical principle and that leads to feelings of guilt if one violates such a principle. If your conscience isn't working, you don't see right and wrong clearly. And therefore, you don't have a motivation to do what's right and not do what's wrong. Plus, if your conscience isn't working properly, when you do wrong, you don't feel like you've done anything wrong. Now, what did Paul say the problem was? Herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and man. That Greek word, there's one Greek word translated void of offense. The root word of that Greek word, void of offense, means to put your sword in the sheath. It means to quit fighting. To quit opposing. Notice the word co-perception is Strong's definition of the word conscience. The definitions of the above word from, uh, from Webster's, it, it's co, it, it, it's together with. In other words, the reason my conscience works is that I'm not the one determining what right and wrong is. I have a co. I have somebody working with me. I have somebody participating with me. That somebody is God. So God's spirit working with my spirit is the reason I know right and the reason I know wrong. It's also the reason that when I do wrong, I feel bad. But if my conscience is offended, I lose the co. So now all of my perceptions are of strictly human origin. And none of them can be trusted. Did you hear what I just said? Then when you have an offense, the one person you can't trust at all is you. That when you have a grudge, you can't trust your thoughts. You can't trust your feelings. You can't trust your understanding of anything. And you can't trust any decision you make to be reliable. Because it's all warped. It's all, it's all unbalanced. There's, God is not involved to keep you balanced, to keep you thinking right. You lose the co. Is it really worth that to have a grudge? Is it really worth it to lose the working of God's Spirit with your spirit to keep you headed in the right direction? Is there anything anybody can 
possibly done to you that is worth losing that benefit from God. Praise God. D. When I allow my conscience to be polluted by an unresolved offense, my conscience is thus wounded. The wound is the loss of my co, my partner in perception, the voice of the Spirit of God. All of my perceptions, my feelings, opinions, etc. become the product of human reasoning and judgment and therefore are unbalanced and unreliable due to the lack of divine input and inspiration. These feelings, opinions, conclusions, decisions, etc. cannot be trusted and will only produce problems, divisions, and disappointments. When you lose the co, you stand to lose the truth. In my lifetime, every man of God that I've seen lose his way concerning the truth, it wasn't because he got a revelation that God doesn't require this, that, and the other. Every man of God, and I can name, name you name after name after name after name. Some well-known men, some little-known men, but all men of God who lost their way, gave away the truth, gave away holiness. Some even gave away their ministry, all because they had an offense and they trusted themselves when they were the last person on earth they should be trusting because all of their perceptions were wrong. Their perceptions of the Bible were wrong. When you get, when you have an offended conscience, what you see in the Bible can't even can't be counted on. Because your mind is not seeing it with God's input. You're seeing it only from a human standpoint. And your flesh is looking for an excuse. And when flesh goes to the Bible to find an excuse so that it can continue to be what it is and continue to do what it does. And you're doing that from from the perspective of not having the Spirit of God involved because He's not going to fellowship with a wounded conscience that refuses to forgive. You can't trust anything you see because you're going to find good excuses. They're going to look, and you're going to be persuaded that it's truth. You're going to be persuaded that it's right, and you're going to follow that, and it's going to lead you to destruction. And I've seen it happen over and over and over again. In fact, in the 20, 25 plus years that, that Brother Willoughby's been here, there are men that have been in leadership in this church that are not in leadership anymore. Do you know why? If we could pull the covers off and look at the real issue, the issue was they got offended and then disqualified themselves to be at leadership. And you know how you can tell one of those people? Because now it's everybody else's fault, not theirs. They're innocent, and it's everybody else to blame. And they've been mistreated. They've been wronged. And let me tell you something. The problem with a root of bitterness is it defiles many other people. And if, and, the, and if you listen to that person's poison, that person's bitterness, then you will become infected with their bitterness. You know something? If you have an offense and you share it with me and I become con- offended because you've been wronged, God deals with you. You repent because you're the one offended. But you know how many people I know that have never gotten back from being nothing more than the person that listened? You know, I've never smoked in my life, but my dad was a smoker. They didn't think anything of it way back then when we were kids. But now we know you can get cancer from secondhand smoke. 
even if you never smoke, you can get cancer. If you're in a place where you're subjected to cigarette smoke all the time, you can get cancer from secondhand smoke. That's why now in, in most, most nations on earth, majority of public buildings, they don't allow smoking in public buildings anymore. Because if you work someplace, how do you leave there? If, if, there, if somebody's smoking near you, you can't. Well, let me tell you what happens with bitterness. There are people that go to hell over secondhand bitterness. It wasn't their problem. It wasn't their offense. But they took somebody else's offense. They took somebody else's problem. And, and, and I've seen it happen more times than you can imagine. The person that had the problem, God convicts them and they get right. But how does God convict you of a grudge you're holding if it's not even your grudge? You better be careful what you listen to. You better be careful what you listen to. You better be careful whose side you take. My Lord. B on page 7. Unforgiveness is just as damaging, regardless of who is the target of my grudge, God, others, or myself. If shame is, in fact, a grudge that I have against myself, I will suffer all the above itemized consequences, even though it is myself I refuse to forgive. Brother Wright, that doesn't make sense. That's, that's not right. Now, you're missing the point. A grudge is a grudge is a grudge. I got a question. Paul said, herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and men. I can have a grudge against God. And this sounds strange. But if I'm going to get right with God, I got to forgive God. I pray and ask God to do something. He doesn't do it. Or I pray and ask God to stop something, not let it happen, and he lets it happen. I get a grudge. Oh, but it's against God. It doesn't make any difference. I got a grudge against God. The only way I can get right is to forgive God. Well, I got a question. If having a grudge against God will bring all these things on me, am I greater than God? So if I can have a grudge against God, doesn't it stand to reason I can have a grudge against myself? If I can have a grudge against the greatest one, I'm sure, I sure can have a grudge against the lesser one. If I have to forgive the greatest one to get right with God, then i got to forgive the lesser one to be right with God. That's just common sense, isn't it? I don't care how strange it sounds. Just between me and you, having a grudge against God doesn't sound any less strange than having a grudge against myself. And yet the great apostle Paul actually made the statement that he exercised himself daily. A lot of people have workout routines. Paul had a spiritual workout routine. Every day he exercised himself to make sure he had no grudges against God and men. He was a man. Men, there's not the gender. It's humanity. Hello? This is important stuff. The great apostle Paul, the one thing he did every day more than anything else was to make sure he didn't have a grudge against God. Well, why would he have a grudge against God? Oh, let's see. Three times he was beaten with 40 stripes, save one. He was beaten with a stick. How many times was he in jail? Hello? He was accused, falsely accused. He was rejected. He was un in peril of brethren that were uh, 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 people that from without and brethren, false brethren from within. Read his, his uh, inventory of the stuff he went through and then you'll understand why. If the great apostle Paul could go through all of that stuff 
and felt the need to make sure he didn't get a grudge against God, I don't think I'm exempt. Anybody sitting here with, without any disappointments? I don't think so. Anybody sitting here without any negative feelings over things that should have happened and didn't happen or things that didn't happen that should have happened? I think so. I think everybody sitting here has some feeling like that. The question is, is it a grudge against God? Is it affecting our relationship? Do you know there are people, Christians, who don't pray? Not because they're slothful. Because it's their way of punishing God. You ever had anybody give you the silent treatment? Why were they giving you the silent treatment? They were letting you know they're, they're not happy with you. And they're not talking. I don't know if they have that slang over here. But, you know, it's, it's, it may not be popular right now. But it has been... Talk to the hand. In other, in other words, don't talk to me. I'm not listening. And I'm not talking back. Well, I got a question. If the silent treatment is a, is a method of showing anger and, and punishing somebody, a human, then you, do you mean to say that a person that is participating in the silent treatment of God by not praying is an also doing so to punish God? There's some of you sitting here. You know you need to pray. Your mind says, I need to pray. I need to be faithful in prayer. But no matter how much you tell yourself that, and no matter how hard you try to do that, guess what? You just find you don't pray. And so you're looking for all kind of answers as to why you don't pray. And I'm telling you right now, one of the main reasons people don't pray is they're mad at God. You ever had this feeling? Psh, what's the use of praying? He doesn't answer. Hello? You ever said that? Guess what that's called? An offense. Oh, no, Brother Wright, that's just, I'm lacking confidence in God because I prayed and he didn't answer. No, you've got an offense. Rather than deny it, you need to acknowledge it so you can deal with it. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let's pray about that a moment. Let's, let's talk to the Lord about it. Lord, pull the cover back and help us to be honest with you and honest with ourselves, Lord. Help us to be honest, Jesus. Help us to be honest. Lord, those things that we thought were innocent feelings... Help us to forgive you. Things that we ask you to do that you didn't do for whatever reason. Things we ask you to not allow to happen that you allowed to happen for whatever reason. And the feelings that we have toward you because of it. Help us, Lord Jesus, to give those feelings to you today and not carry those around. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. My, 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 my. Come on, the Holy Ghost is here right now trying to help us. Come on. Come on, there's some precious people sitting here that God wants to use you mightily in prayer, but you don't pray at all. And you don't know what's wrong with you. What's wrong with me? How many times have you said that? What's wrong with me? I know I'm supposed to pray. I know I need to pray. Why don't I pray? What's wrong with me? I'll tell you what's wrong with you. you got a grudge against God. You've got a grudge against God. You're not happy. You prayed. He didn't perform. In the name of Jesus. One more minute. Come on. Come on. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on. You and the Lord need to make peace. Because if you can't talk to him freely, if you don't desire to talk to him, you're not at peace with God. Come on. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Roman numeral four. Let's, we're going to define shame. Now, the next little while, we're going to talk about something. We're going to approach this a little less emotionally and a little more factually. That'll give you a chance to breathe. Because some of you are holding your breath because you're getting pummeled because every word seems to be so personal and it's hitting you right in the chest. And you need a chance to get, catch your breath. So this is hopefully going to be a little bit more factual and a little bit less personal, but maybe not. Maybe not. Shame is defined as the painful feeling of the loss of self-respect. That's the actual definition of the word shame, technically. Shame emphasizes the humiliation felt at the loss of esteem. Oh, I don't have shame. I've just been humiliated. Hello? I don't have shame. I just don't like myself. Hello? Have you ever done this? You look in the mirror. Let's see. Now, I'm, I'm not being hypothetical here. This is what I see in the mirror. This ear is higher than this ear, and... This ear lays back a little bit more. This one sticks out a little bit more. And you understand? You see what I'm saying? You look in the mirror and you pick it apart until by the time you're done, you don't want to look in the mirror anymore because you despise everything you see there. I see I have some folks that's done the same thing I have. Well, most of you have fairly smooth skin. You ought to try to live in, with this ever since you were a teenager. I don't have dimples. Those are scars. You have any idea how old I had to be before I stopped seeing those as the first thing I looked at when I looked in the mirror? Well, I tell you what, it was well after I turned 38 and started getting healed of shame. See, there are things that seem minor, but they're symptoms. Okay? Shame emphasizes the humiliation felt at the loss of esteem. Shame includes the idea of feeling humiliated or embarrassed as from a sense of inadequacy or inferiority. Shame also includes the pain, everybody say pain, the pain caused by losing the respect of others. Losing the respect of others is painful. Shame can only develop through, prob through problems in interpersonal relationships that are significant to us. If, I, uh, if I'm walking down the street and somebody says, who are you, jerk? Well, I'm not going to like that. But five minutes later, I'm not even going to be thinking about it. Now, if my wife walked in the house and said, what are you doing, jerk? Hey... We got a problem. Hello? You see what I'm saying? You can only really develop shame as a result of problems in interpersonal relationships that matter to you. Praise God. Shame is always a product of the failure or perceived failure to meet the expectations of someone from whom we desire to receive approval. Whether it's God, our parents, our pastor, our husband, our wife, our kids, our employer, etc., etc., etc. If I need approval, if I desire to to receive approval from someone that matters to me and I don't receive that, I lose self-respect. 
my, my human nature isn't to say what's wrong with them. My human say, nature says what's wrong with me. I'm not good enough. Or the girl you're trying to impress or the boy you're trying to impress, but they don't seem to notice you. Well, you talk about painful. That's pretty painful, isn't it? I don't expect to hear any amens over that, but I heard them anyway. <laughs> Praise God. Shame is always a product of the failure or perceived failure to meet the expectations of some from someone from whom we desire to receive approval. This failure results in rejection or perceived rejection. I can't emphasize how much that's the case. Boy, it's an amazing thing when you shockingly find out that someone you thought was rejecting you wasn't rejecting you at all. You were completely misreading their whole attitude. I mean, it's possible for somebody, you know, being a pastor is you know, it's difficult because sometimes you can't walk slowly through the crowd and shake hands with everybody. Sometimes you got something you, you, got, you got your mind on, something you got to do. You need to do it right now. And the next thing you know, you're just walking right by everybody. And what do all these guys do? The pastor didn't speak to me. He's rejecting me. Well, that's your perception. It wasn't his intent. There's some of us with shame that's not even from real situations. Only situations we perceive to be that way. Oh, Jesus, help us. Therefore, failure and rejection are the key elements of shame. Failure, I cannot overemphasize this. The two primary elements of shame are failure and rejection. The two primary catalysts of shame is some situation that's caused me to feel like a failure or somebody that's made me feel like a failure or I reject myself or I feel like somebody's rejected me or I feel like God's rejected me. I'm not good enough. Praise God. Suffering rejection from someone I desire to please may result in me rejecting myself when I feel that I'm not good enough to be accepted by the people that I consider most important to me, I will usually reject myself. This self-rejection is called shame. Shame says this to us. You are a mistake. You are a flawed and defective human being. You will never be good enough. You will ultimately be rejected by everyone as soon as they find out who and what you really are. You are a failure. What's your batting average like on that one? What, how are you doing? Two out of five? Three out of five? Four out of five? How about some of you that hadn't missed a pitch? Five out of five. You know what's really positive about this? I don't know you. Most of you, I don't even know your name. I don't know where you're from. I don't know how you live. I don't know what your history is. I don't know any of that. So how could I be reading off a page and telling you your life story? i tell you how. The encouraging thing about all this is I'm not weird. I'm not strange. What's wrong with me is really easy to be defined. And it's a problem a lot of people have. But it's fixable. I'm not permanently like this. I can be changed by the Lord. Let's try that out. I don't care how loud you say it, but I'm asking you to say it. My problem is not permanent, please. God can change me. 
Let me tell you something. You say, well, I, I don't believe that. Well, let me tell you what. If I, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, if I have enough faith to just say it, whether I think I believe it, whether I feel it or not, that's enough faith just to keep me steady till I can let God help me. That's enough faith to keep me from going deeper in the pit because I need to say that. I need to say that. You need to say that. What's wrong with me is not permanent. God can change me. Or right, here's another way of putting it. What's wrong with me is not permanent. God can heal me. God can deliver me. You know what? Until you really are beginning to walk in that deliverance. If I were you, I'd say that every day. Why? Because you've spent most of your life saying the opposite. What's wrong with me is permanent and nobody can fix this. Tell me that's not true. How many of us have sat, sitting here have given up any hope of being any different the way we are? It's hopeless. I'm useless. I'm forever flawed. Now, maybe you don't think that every day, but there's a whole lot of you here that's thought that at some time, some of you not too, recent, not, not too far in the past, fairly recently. Let's talk about the sources of shame. I said this was going to be more factual, but you can't talk about this without it hitting bullseye over here and bullseye over there. <laughs> you know, so if I hear you go, ow, I'll know. I hit, I hit the mark. <laughs> sources of shame. The key sources of shame are, first of all, my own actions. The most obvious sources of shame are those things that I did that I wish I had not done or those things that I did not do that I wish I had done. For instance, maybe you've had a, maybe you've had a loved one pass away and you knew you needed to, to tell them you loved them. I'm just going to use something very simple. You knew you needed to sit down and say you loved them, but you kept putting it off and you didn't do it, and they passed away before you could tell them. And now you have no way of fixing it. That's, uh, that's a hard one to deal with. For instance, sins that I committed that were particularly damaging to me or someone else that I cannot get over or forget about and never feel forgiven for, especially sexual sins. I mean, if you give away your virginity, precious ones, you can get forgiven for it, but you'll never get it back. And the fact that you never get it back is a major source of shame. And you have to really let the Lord help you to ever get over the fact you gave it away in a, a, in a sinful manner that God didn't bless. Let me tell you something. In the heat of the moment, where you think, where, where your feelings say, there, there can't really be anything this bad wrong. This feels too good. It's got to be okay. And you make a decision and, and, and in that moment where you've justified yourself. But let me tell you something. The minute it's over with, oh, it's not joy and elation you're feeling. Horrible shame comes. I've dealt with this with so many people so many times. And, and, and that's the common experience they say. Shame comes. It just overwhelms them. And, and, and there are people that they could be saved. Their life's not over. Their ministry's not over. Their Christianity's not over. It just feels like it. And I'm not trying to justify it. It has to be dealt with. I have to deal with the sin of it. But once I've dealt with the sin of it, I'm not finished. It's not done. I'm not okay. I have to deal with the shame of it. And I will live with the memory that I've done that forever. But here's the difference. Can you see this scar? See it? Watch this. It doesn't hurt anymore. I have the memory of how I got that scar. But it's no longer an open wound. I am now healed. It no longer hurts. 
You want to know if you've got a wound? What is it you can't think about without having an emotional reaction? Or let me back up. How many things are there that you do your best not to think about because of the negative emotional reaction you have to it? Anything, any memory, any memory that you have that when you think about it, you have a negative emotional reaction, it is a wound that is unhealed. Well, I don't believe God intends. Oh, yes, he does. He intends to take all that away. If I will let him, he will heal. He will not take away the memories, but he will take away the pain from the memories. Because here's the problem. If you've got pain, the wound is unhealed. It's still open to infection. You're still vulnerable. But once it's healed, I have the memory, but I'm no longer vulnerable. I cannot be negatively affected by that open wound in my spirit. It's not enough to be forgiven. Forgiveness deals with me and God and my eternity. But that's all it deals with. It doesn't fix the way I feel about myself here and now. I've got to deal with the way that my actions have made me feel. Otherwise, I leave myself open. Additional things under number one. Goals that I did not reach which greatly disappointed me. Or let someone else down causing me to feel that my life will be over forever and will be complete, incomplete forever. Have, have a goal. Maybe, maybe you intended to become an, an architect or a doctor or whatever it was your goal was. But you're, you turn out completely different than that. And you feel like, you know, I, I've wasted my life because I didn't become this, that, the other. Or my parents had this goal for me and I'm trying to meet their goal and I've disappointed them. Some of you sitting here, your parents are just absolutely unhappy over the fact that you're a part of this. When we first started our church almost 40, over 40 years ago, but uh, in the first couple of years of the church, there was a girl. She was loose as she could be. She was sleeping with everybody and she was using drugs and alcohol. Her life was a mess. Her family was Catholic. Some friends brought her to church. She got baptized. She got the Holy Ghost. God forgave her, cleaned her heart up, cleaned her life up. She completely changed. When her family found out she was attending a Pentecostal church, they made this statement. We would rather you be a prostitute than Pentecostal. That's no lie. It's an honest truth. They got their wish. They got their wish. That girl that God had completely delivered. They kept on her, kept after her, kept pressuring her until she walked away from the church. But when she walked away from the church, it didn't leave her def with, with any defense. And the pit she was in, before she got saved, she became seven times worse. Another point. Things that I earnestly intended or greatly desired to do, but missed the opportunity to do because of ne neglect, procrastination, etc. Again, speaking to someone who died before I could get to them, apply for a job, go to college, marry a certain person. You know, you, you're in love with somebody, but you don't ever tell them. You don't act on it. And before you can do that, they fall in love with somebody else, get married, and then you feel like you waste the rest of your life not having opportunity to be married to that person you were in love with. Source of shame. B, another source of shame is rejection. Again, the real or perceived rejection by someone of significance to me. For instance, withholding affection. Mental or emotional abuse, usually by means of verbal abuse. For instance, a parent saying to a child, why are you so stupid? You'll never amount to anything. 
Why can't you be like your brother? Why can't you be like your sister? Why can't you be like your cousin? What's your problem? Let me tell you something. Your parents may mean well, but you can't shame a person into excelling. Shame is the worst motivator in the world. You don't build somebody up by tearing them down. You don't encourage somebody to become something by telling them they aren't anything. I was in uh, Richmond, Virginia, which is about an hour and a half south of Washington, D.C. I was ministering in a church there on shame. And, uh, and like I am do any time, but especially when I minister on this kind of subject, I'm constantly have my feelers out, seeing what the Lord is saying to me so that I can make sure I hit the points I need to to help the people that are sitting there. And, and there was a man sitting uh, right off the center aisle, and, 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 and I mean, he was classic shame. He had, he had all the symptoms of shame. It was, it was terrible. But when I would go by him, I would, I would kind of try to feel, okay, let's see, has he been, uh, was he molested? No, no. Was he abused? No, 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 whatever. And, and I never could, it was, it was weird. I could never feel what it was that was causing them this. And all of a sudden, I was, I was ministering and walking by, and I just stopped. And I looked at that guy and said, your dad never told you he loved you, did he? And you tried everything you knew to get him just to say, I love you. And now you're in the church and you have a heavenly father and you think he's treating you the same way. You think you're trying so hard to get God to say that he loves you, but it doesn't feel like he's ever saying that, does it? He just broke down and began to weep. He wasn't raped. He wasn't molested. He hadn't killed anybody. But the man... The man's whole life had been affected by the fact he loved and respected his dad. He just wanted his dad to say the words, I love you. But his dad wasn't able to do that for whatever reason. Didn't do that. And it just completely twisted this man's whole opinion of himself. Simply because he couldn't do that. Another man I've worked with for years. He, tra- he wanted his dad's approval. His dad was outwardly very successful. But he was a h- terrible father and a terrible husband. And he could never do anything well. And, and, and it was really, it was bad. And this boy was a basket case because of it. He felt like he was a complete failure at, at winning any of his dad's approval whatsoever. And you know what I said to him? Hang on a minute. I said, if you were thirsty and somebody handed you a a glass that was empty, would you hold on to that empty glass and try to get water out of it and end up dying of thirst? Or would you acknowledge, well, there's no water in that glass. I'm going to go find where water is. I said, the problem is your dad never had any approval. Your dad doesn't even like himself. Look at all the symptoms. He doesn't like himself. You're expecting your dad to give you something he doesn't have. And you've allowed your whole life to be, to be devastated because your dad cannot and does not give you what he doesn't have to give. He doesn't have it to give. The problem is this, under B2, subconsciously, the rejected person blames themselves for not being able to do, to be or to do good enough to be accepted. That's called shame. Shame is a grudge I have against myself. Shame is the painful feeling of the loss of self-respect. Shame is self-blame. In light of last night's lesson, part of the part of the lesson from last night, all of those things keep me from believing God loves me. 
If I'm not good enough for my natural father, how can I be good enough for my heavenly father? That's the way the emotions work. That's what it feels like. But it's not God. It's not true. Okay? Uh, Number C, alienation. This includes the idea of the extremity of alienation, which is abandonment. Alienation is one thing, but in the extreme, it's abandonment. For instance, victims of sexual infidelity of their mate. The innocent victim often ends up with more shame than the person that committed the sin. A man commits adultery. His his wife is devastated because of his unfaithfulness, yes. But she doesn't battle as much his unfaithfulness as the feeling she has about herself for not being good enough for him. So you can't just help her deal with her grudge toward her husband because of his sin, his unfaithfulness. You can't just do that because it's far more complicated than that. His actions have made her feel less than enough. And the problem with shame is that while she's blaming him with her mouth, she's blaming herself with her emotions. You talk about being caught between a rock and a hard place. That'll grind you to powder. Victims of divorce, either the mate or the child. It is proven by medical science that children who are a part of a family that divorces this, see, now this, this, that's why we're talking about emotions here. Logically, There's no way anybody believes that parents divorced because their children were were not good enough. But it feels that way to that child. Other children have moms and dads, but I don't have a mom and dad together anymore because something's wrong with me. Survivors of a loved one who deserts the family. And the worst kind of desertion, survivors of a loved one who commits suicide. Suicide is the greatest act of selfishness that any human being can ever perpetrate on those who stay behind. It's the greatest act of selfishness because the people that are alive after you're dead constantly, 24-7, beat themselves up with the fact they should have recognized, they should have known, they should have done something. And you know what it all means? They end up believing you killed yourself because it was their fault. That if they would have recognized it, if they would have done something, you wouldn't have killed yourself. So you kill yourself, and the people that survive, they die every day at the hands of shame. The word abandon means to forsake or desert. It implies leaving a person or a thing either as a final necessary measure or as a complete rejection of another's claims, responsibility, etc. Abandonment is a terrible thing. I, I, I have uh, children in our church, some that are still children, some that are adults now, uh, that dad just walked out, never saw him again, just walked out. Or mom and dad came together in an illicit relationship, He's con- the child is conceived, the mother births the child, but the dad doesn't want to have anything to do with him. Sometimes they don't pay any child support. Sometimes they don't ever give a card. They don't ever give a Christmas present. They don't ever do anything. And that child grows up thinking, I I must be worthless if my dad doesn't want to have anything to do with me. Number four, or D, abuse. These are defined as violations of the person. For instance, 
physical abuse by a parent or spouse, sexual abuse. Statistically, in the vast majority of cases, the perpetrator is a close friend or a relative. Rape. It's a violation of the person. Self-inflicted sexual abuse. I, I'm sorry, I realize this may be delicate, but I'm trying to make a point here. Masturbation. Pornography. This is abuse. It may be self-inflicted, but it is abuse. It affects you the same way. Pornography, including being forced to watch the indiscriminate sex acts of others. These, these things transfer the, the feeling of uncleanness to the observer as if they had actually participated in the act themselves. And you think, well, that's far out. No, 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 no. I, there's a man that's been in our church ever since he was in his uh, early, early 20s. He's probably now in his mid to late 40s. I've done everything I know to do, everything I can to help him, but he just can't get past it. His mother and dad divorced. He was 10 years old. He slept in the bed with his mother. He was not allowed to sleep someplace else. And she had all kind of men commit sex acts with her in the bed with her son in the bed. Not participating, just in the bed. I mean, that's your mother, and she has no morals. What do you think that says about the person? What do you think that said to that boy about him? I, now, this, this is facts. You, it may, that may sound totally far out to you, but it's not. I've dealt with that. He still has, with, with all the moves of God he's had, with all the times of prayer, he still hasn't been able to get completely past it. He is so wounded by it. He is so damaged by it. He just can't muster any faith at all to let God completely heal him. Can the Lord fix all that? You better believe he can. Can he do it against our will? No, he cannot. I've got a, another lady in the church I've dealt with and helped, and she's made a lot of progress. She's still got a way to go. Her mom and dad divorced when she was like 12. Whenever she visited with her dad as part of the visitation agreement on weekends, starting at age 12, he began to use her as his surrogate wife sexually. He did that for about seven years. It was so shameful. So shameful to her that the only way she could survive before she knew God was she buried that so far down deep in her subconscious it didn't come out up. It sounds impossible, but it's psychologically possible to the point that she didn't even remember it anymore because that was the only way she could survive. But then God, in His love, begins to deal with that by bringing it out of her subconscious. I was, I was there the day. She was in a prayer meeting on a Sunday afternoon when God began to give her those memories back. And then that service that night, I, have never, I thought she was going to die from grieving. She cried so hard with grief, grief so deep, and I didn't know what was wrong at the point. I, I honestly thought she was going to have a heart attack. Because she had buried that down so far just trying to survive, and God loving her, not wanting her to live like that the rest of her life, wanting to make her whole, began to bring those memories out of her subconscious to her mind, just trying to help her, but she couldn't, she, 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 the grief with it was just absolutely, it was one of the most horrible things to watch I've ever seen in my life, to watch her go through that grief. It was horrible, but I had my hands on her head, my wife and I and some others were praying for her when that thing began to lift. And to watch her go from grief so deep that I thought she was going to have a heart attack to her hands raised, her face shining, and the Spirit of the Lord pouring out of her in tongues and joy. It was an amazing miracle. I don't have to see the dead raised to believe God can do it. I watched him do it that night. She wasn't naturally dead, but she might as well have been. You know the problem? 
we come to church, and we sing nice songs, and we preach good messages, and we leave church feeling good, and we don't have any idea what the person sitting next to us is carrying. And we don't even realize that we have a God that's able to fix the broken. It's the greatest miracle that God ever does outside of salvation is to take a life that's damaged, that's broken, that's convinced that, they're, that they have no hope of ever being normal and watch it, God, make them whole. What an amazing thing it is to watch God do that. You know why you need to receive this healing for yourself? Because once you've received it, here's what the Lord says. Freely you've received. Freely give. You need to be able to know what to do and say to help hurting people out there. If we who are part of this can't get the help, what hope do they have? And once we get the help, if we're going to keep it to ourselves and not help them, then we lose the benefit of it. Because then we make all the help we've gotten purely selfish, which there's shame in that all by itself. Oh, praise God. And then finally, uh, E, class rejection. There is shame experienced by a group of people because of rejection experience as a group. In America, uh, African Americans... There, there, is a, there is a generational shame over having their ancestors ripped out of Africa, forcibly, humili humiliatingly brought to America and forced into slavery. And then even after being set free, still being treated as second-class citizens by many people, hopefully not the church, even though I can't guarantee that 100%. Our church is extremely multicultural. There is no predominant color in our church. There's no predominant race. We don't just have blacks and whites. We have every other color you can imagine. You can't hardly find a more diverse group than we are because that's, that, that is the miracle. It is a miracle when God can take people that are not a people and bring them together and make them a people. That's why if, you only want to, if you're only trying to reach people like you, you don't have the Holy Ghost. Because two people of Chinese descent worshiping together is no miracle at all. I said that's no miracle at all. If you love those that are like you, you don't have any grace working in your life. That's why the miracle of the church is when we can love people who aren't like us and, that, and, 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 and reach the place in a short amount of time where we don't even see they're different. That's not even an issue. That's our brother. That's our sister. Huh. We got young people who have been raised in our church that are married. One particular couple that I'm thinking of, she is Norwegian. She's so white, she shines. He's African-American. But a lot of African-Americans, you know, well, if you've been in America more than one generation, you've probably got some mixed blood in your heritage because that's just the way it is. It is a melting pot. And you put it all together and stir it up and it comes out whatever, right? But he still, for whatever reason, even though his family's been in, the, in America for four or five generations at least, he is so black he shines. And they're married. They don't even see a difference. They don't see a difference. And I'm not preaching for or against interracial marriage. I'm preaching against for a church that doesn't see people differently. We see souls.
but there are nationalities here in Asia. Some nations that have been dominant and other nations that everybody and his brother over the centuries has run over them. And they have a, they have a generational shame that they have to overcome. Because when they're around people of other, genera- uh, other nationalities, they automatically feel inferior because they've been told they're inferior. That has no place in the body of Christ. But that doesn't keep people from bringing those feelings in here from the world. And we all need to get healed so we don't have that. Oh, that was pretty weak, but I understand. It's okay. Finally, I said the other one is whatever. But this is the last uh, source of shame. Here it is. You ready? Self-destructive behavior. Shame begets more shame. Shame begets shame. Shame fathers shame. If you've got shame and you keep shame, you won't have the same amount of shame. It will always be producing more shame. If I, if I'm, if I have shame, I will interpret all kind of things as rejection of me and all things that all kind of things I do as failure by me and my and the rejection and the feelings of failure only cause me to have more shame and and it, I can become more and more paralyzed by that shame Shame begets shame Praise God Shame is the root cause of all self-destructive behavior Here is the cycle of shame. I want to read this to you. The cycle of shame is we start out with a shame-based identity. I begin to associate myself with the person that rejection has convinced me that I am. Someone worthy of more and more rejection. I begin to expect to be rejected because I deserve to be rejected. That becomes the feeling. I become convinced that I am hopelessly flawed as a person and that there is no power within me to change me. That produces this. The shame-based identity produces distorted thinking. I become convinced that I need someone or something more than I have within me to be happy, to feel complete, or to feel better about myself. If I could just find something from outside of me that is better than what I have within me, I could become a better person and feel better about myself. That's why people become alcoholics and drug addicts. Because drugs let you live outside of yourself. Alcohol lets you live outside of yourself. That's why some people become promiscuous. Because if, I, if, if, if the opposite sex finds me attractive, I can live outside of me and live in the fantasy of what I think they feel about me. It means I have to give myself away. But that's a small price to pay to think I'm being accepted. I'm being used, but, I, but I'm just being used. I'm being abused. But I convince myself it's not being used, that I'm really in control, and that I am responding to people who find me attractive. I don't know what the bar scene's like here, and I've never been in the bar scene, but I've dealt with plenty of people who have been in the bar scene, and that's the whole bar scene. People don't go to the bars to drink. They go to the bars to troll. You understand that terminology? They go looking. Here's the problem. It has nothing to do with looks. A man or a woman can be standing at the bar with their back to the door. Someone with lust, a spirit of lust, can come in the back, come in the door, and not even see the person at the bar. This person not even turn around and physically see that person come in. But this spirit of lust connects with that spirit of lust before they're ever even aware the other one is there physically. That's the bar scene. And it's no surprise when they leave the place together. And head someplace to consummate their lust. Because it has nothing to do with physical attraction. But they lie to themselves and tell themselves that the reason we're doing that is because the other person finds me so ravishing. 
It's a lie. You're both addicted to a spirit of lust under the control of it. It's self-destructive behavior. So shame-based identity produces distorted thinking which produces acting out the feelings. I resort to searching for ways to fulfill my lust for things, pleasure, etc. This includes drugs, alcohol, adultery, perversion, gluttony, etc. What does that produce? It produces life-damaging consequences. The results of my actions obviously serve only to severely compound my problems. Now I must deal with the consequences of my actions which have caused an intensification of my shame beyond my imagination, which takes me back to a new, more worse off, if that's good terminology, shame-based identity, and I start the cycle all over again, again, and again, and again. Let's look at the symptom of shame. This is not in an all-inclusive list. This, is, this, this doesn't include all the symptoms of shame. First of all is nakedness. Nothing more closely illustrates the emotional feeling of shame than the thoughts, emotions, etc. of being naked in public. Throughout the Bible, nakedness and shame are constantly and directly connected. Revelation 3.18, say it to the church at Laodicea, he said, I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. The word naked is defined as uncovered, exposed, lacking clothing, means of support, destitute, without protection or defense. It is through the idea of nakedness that the Lord communicates to us the condition of exposure and defenselessness that a person with shame feels. Therefore, we hide. We hide from God. We hide from people. We hide from ourselves. Shame causes us to feel naked or vulnerable. Therefore, we create fig leaf type defense mechanisms behind which we hide. These are not comfortable and they certainly are ineffective, but they are all we've got. Of course, that's referring to the story of Adam and Eve. They fellowship with God every day till they sinned. Genesis 2.25 says, they were naked, but they were not ashamed. Why didn't they see they were ashamed? They were naked? Because they were innocent. Eve takes the, eats the fruit. She gives it to Adam. All of a sudden, their eyes are open, and they see that they're naked. Here comes God for his normal time of fellowship. Adam and Eve hide from God. Notice, God doesn't hide from people with sin and shame. People with sin and shame hide from God. Adam, where are you? I'm hiding. Why are you hiding? I'm afraid. Why are you afraid? I'm naked. And listen to what God said. Who told you? Who told you you were naked? I'm going to go into this in more detail later, but right now, let me say this to you. Shame Medical science has concluded the problem of shame because shame, uh, is, it, shame is really a spiritual issue. But it's so prevalent that medical science has tried to figure out how to, how to deal with it, how to help it, how to work with it because it's so self-destructive. And medical science has, has determined that shame is the product of inner voices. But they're not willing to say Who's doing the talking? They acknowledge that my shame is a result of inner voices saying things to me that I believe about myself that aren't true. But medical science isn't willing to say who's doing the talking. But the Bible says who's doing the talking. Our adversary, the devil, who is the accuser of the brethren. And that word brethren there in that context is not talking about males. It's talking about mankind. And the word devil, again, I said it last night, I'm going to say it again today. The word devil in the gr Greek means 
traducer, according to Strong's. The word traducer means slanderer. Somebody that says bad things about people that are not true. They're only partially true to the point that, they, that the whole lie becomes believable. Yeah, the fact is, I did X, X, Y, Z. But where the devil lies is, he takes what I did and he interprets it to me and tells me what that says about me as a person and what that means about how God feels about me. The fact is, I did that. But what he tells me about my feelings and what I should feel about myself and how God feels about me, that's a lie. That's why he's a slanderer. Hallelujah. Now, listen to me carefully. Men and women that show up in public exposing themselves, they're not cool, they're not, they're not stylish, they're not beautiful. They're not attractive. They're screaming to you, I have shame. Because without shame, no human being appears before other people with their pri the private parts of their body able to be looked at to some degree. Bottom line. Show me a guy that has to wear his pants or his shirt so tight that he doesn't leave anything to imagination. He's not being cool. He's not showing off. He's naked. He's telling you he's naked because he has shame. And so, therefore, shame is a self-fulfilling prophecy. So when I have shame and I feel naked, then I act out how I feel. Show me a woman that she has to dress in such a way that you don't have any doubt what she looks like without clothes on because even with clothes, you can see every curve. Or she only wears enough clothes to not get in public, for, uh, get arrested for being indecently exposed in public. She's not being cool. She's not being sexual. She's not being attractive. She's saying to everybody, I have no self-respect. I have shame, and I'm telling everybody I've got shame. Because a person without shame clothes themselves and does not put themselves on public display. Woo, there's a few of you that didn't like that. Problem is, you've been lying to yourself trying to say that you're trying to look attractive and you're trying to follow the fad. Why, folks, this sinful world's got shame. Of course the styles are going to expose it all. In America, in the 1920s, they passed a law of prohibition. You couldn't sell alcohol. You couldn't sell alcohol. But alcohol was easily available. It's just it was all illegal. The shame, the corporate shame of America got so bad that according to secular news articles, the hymn line just kept rising and rising and rising for the first time in the history. Because you go back to the 1800s, the early 1900s, dresses were up to the neck and they were down to the wrist. And it was, oh man, you want to do something shameful? Expose your ankles. And all of a sudden in the 20s, there was almost nothing left of the imagination. But guess what? When the Great Depression hit in the 30s, and you would think, Clothes with more cloth to them would be more expensive than the clothes they were wearing in the 20s that exposed so much? Not so. Secular studies demonstrate that the worse the economy got, the longer the dresses got again. Because 
People were responding. They were trying to get right with God. They were starving to death. They were losing everything. And according to the secular magazines, people were turning back to prayer. And they were trying to turn back to God because they were just trying to survive. And in that repented condition, they went from exposing everything to covering up. Because when man sinned and they found out they were naked, he covered himself with fig leaves, aprons of fig leaves. Now, I don't know how much an apron covers in Singapore, but in America, an apron doesn't cover a whole lot. Plus, fig leaves are extremely scratchy. And they made aprons of fig leaves and wore scratchy fig leaves next to the skin. But when God wanted to deal with their nakedness problem, guess what the Lord did? He made coats. Man made aprons. God made coats. Man only attempted to partially cover his private parts, her private parts. But when God got through, he covered the body. You know what? Has anybody seen anybody walking down the street lately? I'm just going to use a lady here for an example. In her bra and panties. Anybody seen anybody do that? In fact, it's not only probably illegal, but... You'd have to be kind of out of your mind to walk down the street in a bra and panties. Then tell me why moving off the street onto a beach and calling it a bathing suit that covers less than bra and panties would suddenly is okay. You tell me how twisted the mind has to be to justify that. Or maybe it's not a twisted mind at all. Maybe it's a heart full of shame. You see, it's not about styles. It's not about the amount of clothes you're wearing. It's really about how you feel about yourself in here. That's what it's really about. Because the outward always reflects the inward. Oh, praise God. I didn't plan on going there. 